can, uh, if you want to start introducing, I will try. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so welcome everybody um, to the second annual discussion of uh, autonomous system technology. Um, we have a bunch of good presentations today. Uh, a lot of it is related to the research done uh, through the Google Summer of Code this summer, over the summer, obviously. Um, but we also have uh, an invited speaker from Open Robotics, um, Arasu Tadase. I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Um, and he is going to talk to us this morning about the sort of, um, I wouldn't call it a, a rebranding, but sort of a rebirth of Gazebo in a new form. Uh, and he's part of the team, particularly related to implementing the physics um, modeling for that. And with that, I would like to go ahead and, and roll the presentation. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Adisu Tadesa. Uh, thanks for inviting me to this uh, symposium. Uh, and thanks for attending this talk. Uh, today, I'll be talking about a simulation of autonomous systems and ignition gazebo. Uh, before I do that, though, uh, let me tell you a little bit about ourselves. Uh, we are Open Robotics. Uh, we create open software and hardware platforms for robotics. And we use those platforms to solve important problems. And uh, we help others do the same. Uh, we are approaching about 50 employees for Classic Low. Um, classic Christians in California and Singapore. Uh, we're mostly known for uh, two open platforms, ROS and Ignition. Um, if you're familiar with Gazebo, uh, there's uh, been a transition from Gazebo to Ignition, and uh, we're calling the old one Gazebo Classic, and, uh, and Ignition Gazebo is part of a collection of libraries simply called uh, Ignition. In this account of the timeline, uh, Gazebo 11 is the last release of Gazebo Classic, and it will be maintained until about 2025, uh, but no new uh, features. All development now goes into Ignition, and as you can see, the version names follow an architectural theme. Uh, Fortress is an entire release, and uh, uh, Citadel and Fortress are a uh, long time support. So, what is Ignition? Uh, unlike his well, classic, Ignition is designed to be highly modular and extensible, uh, composed of set of libraries, and each of these libraries can be themselves uh, used in other projects. Uh, for example, uh, Ignition Physics provides a common abstraction for a physics engine, so you can have multiple uh, physics engines implement the same set of interfaces, and then uh, whoever uses Ignition Physics can use all of those uh, physics engines. The uh, same applies for uh, rendering. Uh, Ignition GUI, for example, is uh, has all the QT uh, based graphical widgets used in Ignition Gazebo, but uh, we've seen others use it to uh, create other applications. Uh, one example is Ignition Harvest. Uh, so, going back to uh, simulating autonomous systems, uh, to the autonomous systems, Ignition Gazebo provides uh, robot sensors, environments, a way to control the robots, and a way to visualize data. And today I want to make two points uh, that you can use Ignition Gazebo to simulate various types of uh, autonomous vehicles, sensors, in uh, diverse environments. And uh, if those environments and uh, vehicles and sensors do not need the needs, you can extend Ignition Gazebo uh, to some novel uh, vehicles and sensors. So before we dive in, I want to give you a quick overview of the architecture. Uh, we use a software uh, pattern called Entity Component System. And uh, in this pattern, entities are, identified, uh, are identifiers and they represent things like models, links, and joints, if you're uh, familiar with Gazebo Classic. And each entity has a set of components associated with that entity. And so, so for example, for a link, a component can be its name, it could be its pose, it could be its inertia, etc. And then you have systems, which are pieces of software that manipulate the, the components and the, ent of the entities. 
and these systems interface with external software, for example, with ignition transfer. As this uh, relationship with entities and components and systems uh, manipulating those components that really mix up ignition and gizmo. And the systems can be plugins, uh, so like shared libraries, or it can be classes built into uh, machine gizmo. And uh, uh, surprisingly, we were able to build many of the core features of machine gizmo uh, as systems, not um, built into a core a software based plugins that can be loaded and unloaded. Uh, so for, you know, talking about these systems, um, the, the different capabilities for, you know, such so say, ground vehicles are provided by these systems. So we have different types of vehicles here, uh, diff drive, acronym, me mechanum, uh, track vehicles, and for each of those vehicles we have different systems that provide those capabilities. And, by the way, these uh, vehicles all come from uh, ignition fuel, and let me see if I can. Yeah, so you can see this is a, a service that we provided at Robotics, and it is a collection of just various robots that you can download um, and use in your, in your world. And there's, it would provide like a uh, drag and drop thing that, um, that you can just take this into your ignition zero and it'll bring uh, this robot into your world. Um, and to use it, uh, if you don't want to use the drag and drop, you can just include the URI your, your of that robot and then add this plugin tag into the world, uh, defining what system, what plugin. Uh, to load, and that is, for example, for this, we're using a diff drive. After that, you can use uh, topics to communicate with the robot. Here, we're sending a twist message, and uh, move the robot. You can also do this with ROS2. Uh, we have a package called uh, ROS IGN. It provides a bridge between uh, ignition transport and ROS2 or ROS. And uh, basically, once you have that bridge running, you can send uh, ROS messages, you can publish ROS messages, and those go all the way to the system that uh, controls the robot. Uh, going back to vehicles, we have aerial vehicles, and again, we have systems that um, implement or uh, support those capabilities. Uh, in this case, we have multi capture motor model which actually really simulates the um, dynamics of how you have a power and then uh, you still need some other system to control the uh, motion of the robot. So we have one system called multi-copter velocity control. And this system is built into, uh, is built as a, as a system. Uh, as I'll talk later, uh, you could control robots in different ways. Uh, but if you have a high latency, or sorry, a high frequency and low latency controller, uh, you want to use a system to handle your robots. We also have lift drive uh, that can be used for fixed wing uh, vehicles, and that is, um, it simulates the lift and drag forces on control surfaces of such vehicles. We have uh, marine and submarine vehicles. For those we, um, so those we use uh, different different systems in, in combination. So here we have buoyancy uh, that simulates buoyancy of objects in motion fluid. We have uh, pressure which applies a press force in the direction of the propeller. Uh, we also already mentioned lift drag. Uh, hydrodynamics applies forces caused by the environment. Uh, for example, ocean currents on the robot. Sensors, uh, we have uh, ignition sensors as sweet uh, sensors that are commonly used in autonomous systems. Uh, I have listed them here. Uh, and each of these sensors have a noise model, and so uh, you can use a provided Russian noise model or you can uh, create your own custom uh, noise model. Uh, uh, recently, we've added 
uh, sedimentation camera, uh, and that can be used to generate labeled, generate labeled data for uh, machine learning applications. And some of you might be interested in that. Uh, Speaking about environments and environmental facts, uh, we don't have time to get it uh, detailed into that, but uh, I want to mention that we do support uh, terrains using uh, height maps, which are images that are uh, basically draw uh, dark areas and um, light areas to indicate uh, heights uh, of the environment. Uh, we have physically based rendering, which uh, we can be used to make for realistic uh, environments. And then if you have really large environments, uh, that they can be broken down into levels to improve our performance. Uh, for effects, for environmental effects, we have wind uh, that affects uh, aerial vehicles, uh, other vehicles as well, I guess, if it's strong enough. Uh, water currents on marine vehicles. Uh, we have dust, fog, and smoke, uh, and other effects using particle effects, which is uh, part of vision rendering. So, uh, as we briefly mentioned earlier, for controlling vehicles, you have two options. You can use topics. Uh, this is either through the machine or ROS, uh, and, and this is nice for. Uh, High level control because you have, uh, you know, you have other tooling and maybe different type of programming languages that you can use when you use uh, topics. Uh, but you know, if it's something that uh, requires uh, high frequency and low latency, uh, I recommend using a system. And um, the reason is when we use topics, uh, the simulator is running asynchronously with your other software. So uh, every time the simulator steps, if your control software uh, takes more time than the that uh, the, the, the step uh, time of the simulator, the simulator will just keep going, and your software thinks it's still time x when the simulator is actually at time x plus two or whatever. Uh, if you write a system, the the your system is in sync with the simulator, so the simulator cannot proceed or advance in time until your software has finished computing uh, its control law. So, how do you customize simulation? The main entry point to customizing Mission to Depot is a system, and as if you know, we talked about earlier, a lot of things are built using systems and custom customization uh, is also going to be uh, to learn using systems. So you simply implement this interface. So if you want to create a hoverboard, uh, you create a classical hoverboard plugin. You use the configure uh, function, which is called one time, to read in the configuration uh, variables of your hoverboard. In the pre update call uh, or phase, you apply lift and thrust forces or any other forces you want onto the vehicle, uh, and then um, post update happens after physics, uh, after the physics engine has run its uh, update call, and in that state, in that uh, phase, you can update your internal state. You can uh, publish to an external system or an external software using mission transport and what have you. And for customizing simulation. Same thing applies, no surprise. Uh, we have systems for uh, creating custom sensors, just the same same pattern here, it's just the only difference is that for sensors we have this STF uh, tag called type equal custom, uh, an attribute to the sensor tag. And uh, the system knows that, uh, ignition people knows that when you have type equal custom, that uh, you are going to be implementing uh, your own custom sensor. And then the same way, you know, you do configure call. In the pre-update, you have to create components of interest that physics will, uh, physics or other, other parts of the system, other systems in the, <laughs> other systems in Ignition Zero will populate for you. And then in post-update, you will read uh, components, those components make computations and publish to Ignition Transport. Um, so for visualizing data, 
I will show uh, a demo of demonstrate of various visualization capabilities of Ignition Casino. Uh, here on the right, we're displaying the camera images, uh, color images, and uh, depth images. And then uh, bottom of that is a fighter that you can turn on and off fighter visualization. And uh, that's what you'll see in the blue circles here, hitting objects in the scene. And on the left here, we are visualizing a body, different sensor data. So we're right now plotting the IMU, uh, the top is a kilometer, and the bottom is a uh, periscope. And I'm going to use the Teleop uh, button here to move this quadcopter around, uh, and we'll see the data changing. And what you see here uh, is uh, enabled a fog emitter, which uh, creates fog in the scene and shows up as, as noise in the environment. So yeah, so this shows the different types of uh, visualizations you can have in Ignition Casino. Uh, there are definitely more. Uh, but one other thing that I want to mention here is the, uh, all these nice uh, objects you see in the scene uh, show off the uh, ability to do uh, physically based rendering in Ignition Casino. These are all created using texture maps, light maps, environment maps. And uh, you can do the same. Okay, so you can combine all of these capabilities of Ignition Gazebo to simulate uh, your autonomous systems. You can use it for debugging and uh, developing your control algorithms. Uh, thanks for listening, and I uh, can take any questions you have. Great. Uh, thank you for that presentation. Uh, I think that is a, it seems like that's an extremely uh, useful simulator. Um, and I have a bunch of questions, but I don't want to consume all of the Q&A if someone else has uh, a question that they would like to ask. I don't see any, um, any takers, so I'm going to just kind of grab the floor here. Um, I'm, I'm extremely interested in in how to implement this uh, physics simulator and simulation environment um, for, for my project. Um, and I have a couple of questions related to that. Um, the Kind of like from the overview though, what is the best way to uh, integrate a new system, like one that maybe we're developing uh, into Ignition Gazebo? Like in particular, I wanna talk about how do we, how do we take the simulator output and use the uh, real-time controller to then generate the next command output and communicate it back to it, to the simulator environment. Can you hear me? Yeah. Cool. Uh, yeah. So uh, I think there's uh, two ways to do this in general. Uh, if if you want to kind of reuse your controller for um, you know, you write once and kind of apply it both to the simulator and the um, the, the real device. Uh, people usually use ROS for that kind of thing. And uh, there are ways to, um, you know, use a real-time controller with ROS. Uh, but, you know, if it's like I mentioned in the, in the video, if you have um, something that requires you to be very uh, accurate in terms of timing, uh, and you know, you, you, you can't uh, have one uh, time step delay or, or, or else your controller will just be unstable, that kind of thing. Uh, you know, for example, with the quadcopters, uh, we, in, we first had a ROS based controller. We just used the, uh, the standard, um, not really the standard, but there's, there are drivers out there, there are controllers out there for uh, quadcopters and we end up just using that. And, uh, when your computer is simulating and uh, running the control software, it slows down and you'll start uh, missing steps and the controller was not very stable. So we ended up implementing it with a system. And, and that's like part of, uh, it gets loaded as a plugin into Ignition and, and runs. And you know if, you're, if your computer is slow, 
the whole simulation will slow down, but you'll still get uh, accurate, you know, simulation. And and so, um, so uh, to answer your question, it's kind of it kind of depends on what the the kind of controller you're um, you're 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 making. And if you know, I would I would start out with e either using ROS or Ignition Transport to kind of get the data from you know all the joint data and uh, position data or sensor data using topics. You know, do the control computation and send the control outputs to the to the simulator using also topics. And if that doesn't work, uh, then you probably go into using a system, which is just a C++ uh, plug a class that you, uh, you can pretty much do the same thing. It's just that it's, it wouldn't be reusable for, um, you know, you can't take that code and directly apply it to your real device. I see. Yeah, I was, I'm interested more in the, in the system aspect of it because, for example, if you want to test uh, essentially a software in the loop control algorithm uh, using the simulated environment, you'd want to be able to take the sensor data from the simulator, um, compute the next control step, and then send that back to the simulator to, to you know, to move the actuator um, and then, you know, and continue that way as a way of validating the control algorithm. Uh, so it sounds like the system approach is the way that we'd want to go. Yeah. for that type of application. Yeah, and so you, the only additional thing I would recommend for that though is you know, to have some sort of uh, mechanism to sync between your, your code and the simulator so yeah. that the simulator doesn't keep going while your, your code, your control code is still computing the next you know, output. Cool, okay. And are there tutorials for that? Uh, Sort of, it seems like this is more of an advanced capability. Um, are there are there like tutorials that demonstrate how to do this on a toy problem? Uh, tutorials to do exactly what you described? I don't think so. But there's definitely tutorials for uh, you know, doing the you know, creating a system and also or or alternatively using ROS or ignition transport to control it from from outside. Um, to do exactly what you described, there is one. I can think of an example uh, in the ROS IGN uh, repository where we we could we didn't want to use um, topics for point cloud data because it was going to be really uh, slow if we did it that way. So we combined ROS and the whole system idea that I mentioned mm -hmm. into one plugin, and then that's. That's probably going to be your best bet. Okay, cool. Yeah. Um, does anyone else have any questions? If not, I have I have uh, one other um, quick question. Actually, it's kind of a two part question. Um, the first part is you said you can for terrain mapping you can actually uh, generate depth or height maps. Uh, is there a way to um, do that automatically if you've got a, a, a digital elevation model uh, of a certain terrain. Is there a way to import that easily? Oh, um, hmm. I am not, I, I don't think that part has been ported yet. I know in Gazebo Classic, there was a way to get, you know, those DEM files yeah. into Gazebo Classic. I am not sure if that has been uh, ported over to Ignition yet. Yeah. Okay, cool. In fact, I don't think it has. Uh, but you, it, the way it currently works right now is you have to uh, give it the, uh, an image, a grayscale image. And I see. How it, okay. Um, yeah. So we'd, we'd have to basically convert a, a DEM into a grayscale and then import that grayscale. Probably. And, yeah. you know, I don't know for sure if the, the way it was done in Gazebo Classic, if there was like a tool that, that did it for right. you or was it... Uh, part of or built into Gazebo Classic. I don't, I'm not aware of that. Okay, cool. And then my last question is, um, is it easy to get the, uh, the camera video frames? Uh, on, on my particular project, um, and as we'll see later on in the symposium, we had a, a machine learning algorithm running on video images as an object classifier. Is it easy to get the video stream um, 
out from Gazebo in order to then run it through the machine learning algorithm? Yeah, yeah. So the images will be streamed out o- over a topic, uh, and you know you can you can record them. You can uh, send them over to a Ross bag or something like that if you want. Uh, and and uh, and I don't know if I meant you know I, I mentioned the segmentation uh, camera briefly, but uh, that one actually generates. Uh, uh, label data in the format that is commonly used in in this space, where uh, it automatically you know you label your objects in the scene, and it will uh, you know in the sensor it will give them different colors and then output their poses and labels in the, in, a, in a format in a text format that uh, you can consume in, in these machine learning applications. Okay, so, very very interesting. Thanks. Um, are there questions from anyone else? Okay. Well, if not, um, thank you very much, uh, Odyssey. I appreciate the, the, um, the presentation and really interesting stuff. And I'm, I'm actually anxious to go ahead and start trying to apply the simulator to at least one of our projects. Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, thanks for inviting me. And, you know, we're always looking for people to contribute to our project. It's open source. Um, yeah. So thanks for the invitation. Oh, very cool. Yeah. Maybe we can collaborate in the future. That would be fun. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, well, uh, going on, Stephanie, from here, I think Rishikesh is still, um, he hasn't been able to join yet. So I'm wondering if we can, um, if, RuPaul is here and it's pretty late for him. I'm wondering if maybe we should run. Uh, I, have, least, I, I need to get the um, his video up. I had. Um, and I'll go ahead, uh, RuPaul, if you're, if you're ready, I'll just go ahead and introduce your, um, introduce your talk and then we can, uh, and then afterwards you can answer questions. So um, this is the RuPaul Sharma is the is one of the two Google Summer of Code students that worked on on our project over the summer, and um, he is going to present on his research here for detecting course markers for the autonomous vehicle. Uh, and the idea here, well, he'll get into he'll get into the idea in, in a second. But he is currently in his senior year at the IIT in in Banaras Hindu University in India. And without further ado, I think we should just run the recording. This summer, as a part of Google Summer of Code, my project is under Open Source Autonomous Vehicle Controller. Hello, everyone. I am Rupal Sharma, senior undergraduate at IIT VHU Varanasi. I worked with Cross this summer as a part of Google Summer of Code. My project is under Open Source Autonomous Vehicle Controller. I will be giving a presentation about detecting course markers for autonomous vehicle. So let's get started. Project goals: Detecting the course markers present on the circuit to help an autonomous vehicle find an optimal trajectory. I used various deep learning and computer vision algorithms for detecting the markers and these algorithms were deployed on Raspberry Pi which will be attached to the vehicle finally. And uh, these informations of the markers location will further be used to find the distance of the uh, marker with respect to the vehicle and angle and other various information. Methodology for object detection algorithm. In this talk, I don't want to go behind the maths behind these algorithms. It is uh, very complex and uh, due to the time limit. But I want to show you how easily anyone can use state-of-the-art machine learning and deep learning algorithms into their work. So this talk is more about uh, how I faced uh, and tackled the problems. Uh, So these are just a broad, very broad overview, the steps which you have to follow. First is data preparation, then image pre-processing, and then training. So data preparation. And believe me, it is the most important step. Let me say this way. It is your data that will decide how well your train algorithm is. 
your data should have as many as kinds of varieties for example uh, i have used we have used cones for as a detector uh, markers so we have many kinds of cones in our training data set uh, by i mean uh, tilted cone and cones at different angles and other various and different varieties as you can think it should be in your data it another important thing is the number of the images in the data set uh, think of this way uh, the deep learning algorithm are network of neuron and each neuron is a trainable parameter i mean it have to be trained during the training so and it contains millions of parameters of these kind so it requires a huge amount of data to train the deep learning algorithm so collect as many as you can now uh, the choosing the image dimensions it is not up to us it is according to the dimension uh, dim uh, dimension of the architecture which will be used to train the model but in the pre processing part what we can do is to use the grayscale images and other types of images but it should be in our data so training the algorithms i will first i want to talk about how to choose a model i mean which architecture which framework which algorithm the simple answer is up to you i mean what do you prefer the accuracy or the inference speed of the algorithm because there is a trade off between speed and accuracy in every algorithm i mean if it has the it has better accuracy then most probably it will have a greater inference time i mean it will take a uh, lot more time to uh, detect and tell the output we 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 go with the accuracy part i have to choose i have chosen two algorithms and trained hundreds of variations of them over the summer so these are two models which i have chosen ssd mobile night and yolo uh, first i want to talk about uh, ssd mobile night so it is single shot detector it is specifically designed for running on edge devices such as raspberry pi and it is the most compatible algorithm or architecture for the raspberry pi so first our first try was to go with this and originally i proposed to go with ssd mobile Lite. it is faster to train and very low inference time uh, due to its compatibility so the tensorflow model zoo have various different architectures of the same algorithm so what they have done is they have used two different or three different algorithms and they have combined them and uh, they have obtained various different results and what we have what we have done is use the architectures and train them on our data set it is called fine tuning and transfer learning the best detection speed obtained on my normal pc is around 30 to 35 fps i have attached the video of the uh, the video was taken by aaron my mentor uh, using car so you can see in this table these are different architectures of ssd mobile Lite, and they have used different uh uh different they are diff using different uh, image dimensions and different architectures for example resnet resnet is a res resnet is short for residual network and uh, as we go down this table the complexity of the model increases and uh, i mean they are much they are increasing in uh, the accuracy uh, in the first column the second column is the mean average precision the third one is the inference time so as we go down 
the table you can see the accuracy of the model is increasing but the inference time is also increasing so this is the this is the trade off which i was talking about so uh, but we have to choose the it specific trade off for that's why we move on to the yolo family so this algorithm yolo v5 which is an acronym for uh, you only look once is developed by team ultralytics they have developed the yolo family in the pytorch framework this is more accurate and more faster than the previous versions it is very easy to train and uh, you can go to their website and go to their code repository and see uh, you will be able to train the algorithm in very few minutes of time if you have a prepared data uh, very less inference time the speed i obtained using this algorithm was around 30 frame per second and it we use this algorithm because it is it was more accurate than the ssd mobile uh, so let's talk about deployment of these algorithm on the raspberry pi so this was the most hard hardest part of my project and i was very certain I, be excited about it i want to tell you why it is a little harder uh, because i have explained the algorithms have millions of parameters so they requires certain computation computational cost to run so anyone's first thought might not be to run it on a raspberry pi but the tensorflow uh, have uh, developed a framework called TensorFlow Lite, which can be used to run, which is used to run on edge devices such as Raspberry Pi. It is nothing, just the quantized version for the TensorFlow model. So what it do is uh, we use the weights of the normal algorithms which we have trained. Uh, and it will convert the float values into the int 8 values so it decreases and optimizes the size of the model which can be used to run on the raspberry pi so we have to convert the model weights into the tf light format it is the hardest part i must say because uh, tensorflow model can be easily converted into tf light model because they are so uh, they are the same uh, family but yolo v5 was in pytorch framework so we have to convert the pytorch framework into the tensorflow model then convert into the tf light format so this was a little harder but i have shared the code so anyone can look at it the algorithm gives uh, around two frame per second inference on raspberry pi which is a little less but can be further optimized to increase the speed so, so the future work can be to higher up the inference speed using a device called coral edge tech tpu we are working on it right now uh, because it requires a different framework to run on it using these results into formulating formulating an optimal trajectory and i have attached to my final report and my blog in the code repository thanks and questions thank you rupaul um i want to add a, a few comments rupaul did a tremendous amount of work with um, multiple um algorithms over the summer and and uh and it, it went remarkably well. We were able to run all of these models eventually on the Raspberry Pi and get results from both video taken from uh, sources found on the web, as well as video taken directly from our ground vehicle. Uh, and the, the, the future work for RuPaul here is to convert, uh, is to get the PyTorch framework converted into uh, 
something that can be compiled by the coral edge TPU because in at least in theory, we should be able to get inferencing of at least an order of magnitude faster using an edge TPU uh, like the Coral USB accelerator. Uh, so it's a pretty exciting thing to have basically a full power machine learning model running on essentially you know, something that's the weight of a flash drive. It's, it's pretty, pretty cool stuff. Um, I guess um, my question, RuPaul, would be, you know, what do you anticipate the difficulty in getting the PyTorch model converted into something compiled using the Edge uh, TPU compiler for the Coral? Is that is that going is that a huge amount of work? Uh, would it be easier with the mobile net detector to do that? What would it take, do you think, in order to use the the Edge compiler for the TPU? Ah, uh, yeah, now I can hear you. Yeah. So uh, the main problem uh, was that the PyTorch uh, is a different framework than the HTPU. So we have to, I have to convert the PyTorch framework, uh, PyTorch weights into first the TensorFlow weights and then uh, convert it into the TF type form. So for running it on HTPU, uh, it requires TF type format, and uh, uh, I think it requires the int eight model, if I remember it correctly. Yeah. So uh, the difficult part is the uh, conversion of different formats, uh, different frameworks. Uh, that is the difficult part uh, because uh, uh, it is not easy to convert a. If they await from different framework into the other framework, uh, but uh, uh, the, I have uh, solved this issue and I have attached the stigma. I have attached the step way method to convert the weights. Cool. Okay. Great. Um, I don't see any questions on the Q and A log. Um, so unless anyone wants to ask RuPaul a question now, um, we can move on to, we can now, I, I see that Rishikesh has joined us, uh, Stephanie, so we can move to his presentation if, if there are no questions for RuPaul. Okay. Well, thanks RuPaul, I appreciate your work as, as always and uh, good luck when you're senior year. And um, now we'll, uh, we'll move on to Rishikesh. Rishikesh was our second Google Summer of Code student. Um, and he worked uh, quite diligently, mostly with uh, Pavlo and a little bit with myself, developing um, an IMU calibration. And, and also he did some um, state estimation or attitude estimation work as well. Uh, all of that can be ported also onto a single board computer. So it can be done essentially all on a vehicle itself as opposed to having to do some calibrations externally. Um, and so his talk is on, on this work about IMU calibration and then a, a novel uh, self-correcting algorithm that he developed for updating the IMU uh, in real time with, with real data. So with that, we can go ahead and roll the video. Hi everyone, I'm Rishikesh Munarsep. Firstly, thank you very much for inviting me to this symposium. I uh, worked with the Center for Research in Open Source Software this summer as a part of my Google Summer of Code program. Mm. I worked in the project related to Autonomous Vehicle Controller in which I worked on IMU-based state estimation. The title of my talk is IMU Calibration and Self-Correction Algorithm for Autonomous Vehicle Controller. Before I begin, uh, uh, explaining my work over here, I'll give a short background on what an inertial measurement unit or an IMU is and what it means to estimate the state of a vehicle using an IMU. So an inertial measurement unit is essentially just a motion sensor and it contains three different sensors, which are the accelerometer, which gives us the linear acceleration about X, Y, Z axis, the gyroscope, which gives us the angular velocity around X, Y, Z and the magnetometer, which gives us the strength and the direction of the magnetic field. 
and uh, while calculating the state of a vehicle we usually calculate the pose which means the position of the vehicle and the orientation of the vehicle with respect to a global frame so if we want to if we want to calculate the change in orientation what we have to do is we have to integrate the angular velocity with respect to time and if we want to calculate the change in position we have to perform double integration with respect to time on the linear acceleration now ideally this should give us the correct pose but the problem this leads to is something called drift essentially if you have a say a stationary object and you're looking at the acceleration of that object but it has a constant error of 0.05 meters per second square this may not seem like a significant error and as you can see uh, in these graphs um, in these graphs i'm representing uh, the error in the acceleration velocity and the calculated position with respect to time so as you can see in, in the leftmost graph in about one second none of the errors are really large but what's happening is that the velocity error is now growing linearly and the position error is going growing quadratically so within the first five seconds the position error has crossed 60 centimeters and within the first minute the position error has crossed 100 meters and if you have a linearly increasing error then it's the velocity error that grows quadratically and the position error that grows cubically so now even if you have something as low as a 0.025 meters per second square error uh, which increases by that much every second for a stationary object your error in the position would be more than a kilometer within just the first minute which is a lot and that's why what we need to do is we need to model these errors accurately and we need to estimate the values of all these error parameters and this process is known as calibration now there are uh, mainly three to four types of errors that we see in all three sensors of an imu the first one is uh, the offset error as you can uh, which you can see in uh, the leftmost diagram over here we can have axis misalignments which could be uh, rotated axis or skewed axis and we could have scaling errors so we can model all of these errors into a single e equation as shown below uh, in this equation we see uh, the true value of any given sensor represented in terms of the scale factors the axis misalignments and the offsets along with the raw measurements now the key contribution of this work is the development of a method for continuous real time calibration of an imu such that it does not require any external physical setup which is usually required by most existing imu calibration methods it also does not require any external re reference of other sensors such as a camera it mainly takes into account the gradual change that might occur in imu parameter values and it quickly converges to new values if the imu parameters suddenly change the second contribution of this work is a comparison study of accelerometer magnetometer sensor fusion algorithms for attitude estimation the key idea that we are using over here is that the direction of the gravity vector of the earth and the direction of the magnetic field of the earth at any given point or any given location are known essentially the gravity vector will always point in the downward direction which is the minus z direction that means that the accelerometer if your imu is stationary will, will always detect that as a pseudo force and will always show an acceleration in the positive z direction which will be of the magnitude of 1g so now if you turn the imu around and keep the imu in different orientations the endpoints of this gravity vector or the endpoints of this acceleration vector will always lie on a sphere because ideally the magnitude of the acceleration vector of a stationary imu is always supposed to stay the same and the same for the direction of the magnetic field now if you normalize these measurements with respect to their magnitude they will always lie on a unit sphere with its center at the origin but 
because of the errors mentioned in the previous slide, the uncalibrated measurements won't lie on a unit sphere, but they'll actually lie on an ellipsoid which does not have its center at the origin. So the idea is that if we are able to find the equation of this ellipsoid, we can use that equation to calculate the calibration parameters, which we can use to calculate the transform that will transform our uncalibrated measurements to the calibrated domain. So uh, in this slide, I have shown the error model that we are using here. XC represents the calibrated measurements that we need to find. X represents the raw measurements and matrices A and B are the calibration uh, contain the calibration parameters that we need to find. If you combine with this with the equation of a unit sphere, we get uh, the ellipsoid equation shown in terms of matrices A and B here. Whereas I have also shown the implicit equation of an ellipsoid in terms of parameters A0 through A8 over here. So the idea is firstly you sample raw IMU measurements. You estimate parameters A0 through A8 by fitting the equation of an ellipsoid to it. And then you use these parameters to calculate matrices A and B. So uh, the first thing that we need to do is convert X, Y, Z to uh, uh, X square, Y square, Z square, X, Y, and so on, a 9D vector, which we will use to calculate another nine dimensional weight vector shown in the compact equation on the right. So this can be done using simple linear, uh, uh, so the fitting can be done using different uh, iterative numerical methods or different regression methods. And then using those to calculate our matrices A and B for calibration can be done using simple linear algebra. Now, uh, our entire repository is open sourced and I have uploaded a, a PDF report in this repository which explains the detailed proofs of these in more detail. So whoever is interested are welcome to visit the repository and check out these proofs. What we started with was different a comparison of different ellipsoid fitting approaches and uh, using that we moved on to the main goal of our work which is continuous real-time calibration. So the first method that we tried for this was the fixed lag method. Over here we essentially consider the k most recent measurements and mm, the new calibration parameters are calculated are calculated after fixed intervals on a window of the k most recent measurements. The reason we are doing this again is that calibration parameters can change over time and we need to always have the most latest calibration parameters. We tried this with different methods and we realized that an iterative least square based method by Dorvo and I've linked all the papers uh, uh, at the end of the slide uh, at the end of the presentation. So the method by Dorvo was the one which worked the best. We performed nine different tests on these, uh, which are the same tests which I've shown uh, in, the, in this slide over here, which included tests using uh, simulated data as well as real data. So this was the fixed lag method. We tried one more method for continuous real time calibration, which was the recursive least squares method or RLS. This method also considers the k most recent measurements, but now past measurements are given an exponentially decreasing weight and we use a forgetting factor to decide how much importance to give to past measurements. The advantage of this method is that we now don't need to recompute a new set of parameters each time. It's just that the existing parameters are updated with each iteration. And again, uh, the detailed mathematics can be found uh, in the report which you can find on the repository. These are some results using RLS. On this graph you can see a 40 second run where the calibration parameters were suddenly changed in between. The y axis over here represents the mean squared error. So you can see that we have a low stable error and once the calibration parameters are suddenly changed, the error suddenly increases. But Within around 4.5 seconds, uh, the method converges back to the new calibration parameters and the error is stab stabilized once more. Now, when we vary the forgetting factor, uh, 
in uh, a lower forgetting factor essentially leads to faster conversions but an increased error and noise and similarly a higher forgetting factor leads to slower conversions but a reduced mean square error now forgetting factor is kind of a counterintuitive term because uh, a lower forgetting factor actually means the system forgets more so maybe remembering factor would be a better uh, a better term for it so again we performed two tests on rls as well as our dorvo fixed lag method the, in the first test we changed all the calibration parameters uh, midway through the 40 second run and in the second test we only changed the bias and we can see that in both the methods uh, rls is able to converge pretty well on the new calibration parameters we also compared the methods to each other and we compared the results obtained from these methods to simple batch calibration before and after the change of parameters occurred and we see that uh, the iterative least square dorvo method gives uh, a lower mean squared error but a higher variance rls on the other hand gives a pretty low mse and variance and is also better than the batch calibration that we were performing coming to real data uh, one test that we performed was the tumble test which as the name suggests you simply uh, tumble the ime around trying to make sure that you cover as many degrees of freedom as possible and uh, well uh, i'm i'm showing the squared error versus iteration on the accelerometer and magnetometer in, in these graphs you can see that the accelerometer readings are much more noisier but the error is still pretty low Uh, the noisiness of this is because of the fact that since we are moving the IMU continuously now, we have an extra acceleration vector, which is kind of contradicting our initial assumption that the acceleration due to gravity was the only acceleration. Uh, in the magnetometer, you can see that the error is pretty stable, other than once one peak that you see, which is simply an outlier. We also used an outlier rejection mechanism. now uh, the main need for this outlier rejection was that while calculating our matrices a and b we are using eigen value decomposition at one point and if we get negative eigen values which usually occurs due to outliers it leads to imaginary scale factors which in the physical world does not make any sense which is especially problem problematic for rls in the graphs below you can see that outlier rejection leads to uh, it gives us a more well distributed error distribution and finally we performed some tests on uh, an actual car now the issue on an a car was that a car is constrained to the xy plane and that is why um, the uh, the rotation is also constrained to just the yaw and there is no pitch and roll so there is a loss of degrees of freedom and because of that we do not have enough dimensions for ellipsoid fitting if you look at the diagram on the left you can see the gravity vector pointing downwards and now if we uh, rotate this gravity vector along the axis parallel to it it will still point in the same direction and instead of getting an ellipsoid we get a single point similarly on uh, the uh, diagram on the right hand side you can see the magnetometer vector pointing in a slightly slanted direction because it is not always uh, pointing downwards or sideways over here again uh, the yaw would give us uh, the points the end points of the magnetometer vector lying on a circle but it would still not give us an ellipsoid so because we do not have enough dimensions for ellipsoid fitting we aren't able to calculate the calibration parameters on the fly on a vehicle like a car so the proposed solution to this was sensor fusion i won't get into uh, all the details of the sensor fusion because uh, of the time constraint but basically we tried a library called attitude heading reference system in which we tried different accelerometer and magnetometer filters uh, together to calculate the orientation of the imu and among these we use uh, specifically the static filters 
which were the filters which do not require any control inputs or vehicle dynamics and we performed different tests on uh, different tumble tests using uh, slow motion medium motion and fast motion in this table you can see the comparison of uh, all of these uh, algorithms that we tried now since we did not have ground truth i am comparing each algorithm results with uh, uh, with each other algorithm and i am essentially calculating the average error between the orientations obtained from uh, any particular algorithm with the orientations for, obtained from any other algorithm and from the data you can see that about each axis the error is is normally uh, between 0 to 5 degrees but there are still cases where the error goes up to as high as 60 degrees now uh, that's it from my side for uh, my gsoc work with cross if anyone has any questions related to this uh, uh, feel free to ask if we are taking questions right now otherwise uh, i would be happy to answer your questions on linkedin i've given my contact information over here so once again thanks a lot for inviting me to this it was uh, a pleasure talking to you thank you excellent no thank you rishkesh that was um, again excellent work uh, from both of our gsoc students uh, do we have any questions from the audience for Rishkesh? Because of course I could ask questions of these people all day long, but I want to make it relevant for for other people. Um, but let me let me ask you one quick question, Rishkesh, and that is, um, and that is, um, what. Of the attitude heading uh, reference systems that you tested, which do you think is most compatible for a resource constrained system like the the Pi four that we talked about in RuPaul's presentation? Yeah. Uh, so I did not uh, get into how much processing each of the algorithm takes, but uh, as far as our use case is concerned, I think uh, using the algorithms that take into account the control input or the dynamics of the system. Those would be really helpful to us because, uh, as I mentioned in the talk, uh, since our vehicle is constrained to the XY plane, the information that we currently have isn't really enough to perform continuous calibration or uh, maybe even the state estimation. So uh, my guess is that uh, the first thing that we should try is using the algorithms which take into account the dynamics of the control inputs. And within those, we can see which are the ones which take the least amount of computing. Perfect. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Um, okay. Um, I have another question if, um, if no one else has one, and that is, I was wondering, Rishikesh, uh, your, your experiments with the car data were pretty conclusive with respect to not being able to estimate particularly accelerometer measurements, but um, even the magnetometer measurements outside of the XY plane. I'm wondering if you think it would be valuable though to implement essentially a 2D version of the magnetometer calibration, given that magnetometer is maybe the one that's most subject to drift over time by uh, essentially limiting the, um, the weights of the, well, basically calculating only a 2D uh, heading angle from the IMU and then using a recursive least squares uh, online calibration to just update the essentially the in-plane heading of the IMU. What, what do you think of that idea? Yeah, I think that's actually a really good idea because uh, the upside of uh, you know having the vehicle constrained to a single plane is that we also have a prior of uh, the orientation about two of two of the axes. So uh, we can definitely implement a two D version of the algorithm and uh, see how well we can estimate the parameters in 2D and also how well we can estimate the heading direction to that. Cool. All right. Uh, well, again, thank you for your work. I truly appreciate um, all the work for you, to, you did for us over the summer. And, and we hope to um, be seeing implementations of uh, the recursive least squares algorithms in our vehicles moving forward. Um, we have time for one last uh, presentation. Hopefully Pavlos isn't too long. 
but I wanted to give him uh, the opportunity to present here as well. Um, Pavlo is uh, a member of the Autonomous Systems Lab, like myself, and his talk today is on a, basically, it's a method that will allow us to do um, pathfinding for resource constrained systems. Um, we're calling it a partitioned Krieging method, and but the title of his talk is called Partitioned Gaussian Process Regression for Online Trajectory Planning for Autonomous Vehicles. And with that, Stephanie, you can roll the video. Hello, everybody. My name is Pablo Blastos, and today I'll be talking about partitioned Gaussian process regression for online trajectory planning for autonomous vehicles. I am a PhD candidate at the Autonomous Systems Lab at the University of California at Santa Cruz. So just a brief overview of what I'll be talking about. Uh, we'll talk about ordinary creating. We'll talk about uh, ways to improve that using something called an iterative inverse. We'll talk about partition creating, and then we'll show you some simulation results uh, and exactly how that played out. So a little bit of background. So trajectory planning can oftentimes vary in computational complexity. And uh, this is usually informed by something like spatial estimation. That can also vary a lot in computational comp um, complexity. So one way to do spatial estimation to inform the trajectories that you're planning for your autonomous vehicle is to use something called Gaussian process regression and specifically something called ordinary creaking. <clears throat> now, one of the uh, drawbacks to using this powerful method is that uh, we have to invert a covariance matrix. And this has a computational complexity of O of n to uh, cubed. So where n in this case is the number of measurements. So as we get more and more measurements, <clears throat> then it takes uh, exponentially longer to compute this um, inverse of the covariance matrix. Now performing an iterative inverse uh, can speed this up and I'll talk about exactly what that is, but it only brings it to O of n squared. So we had an idea to do part to partition the field uh, in an intelligent way that's informed by an aspect of ordinary creaking. And what this is used for is a project that is connected with the uh, open source uh, autonomous vehicle controller um, that's part of uh, CROSS. And this is the Slug3 autonomous surface vehicle. So this is actually using that that framework uh, and that hardware to do uh, path planning and to do spatial estimation. And in this case, the spatial estimation is uh, depth sense data. So there's a, an, a sonar echo sounder that's connected to uh, this boat. It's right here. And that is uh, measuring the distance from the surface of the water roughly to the floor of um, either the ocean or lake, or in this case, uh, just a pond. So ordinary creaking is based off of something called the empirical variogram. And that is this equation here, equation one. And what this is doing is it's relating how correlated two points in space are based off of their distance. So one of the assumptions here is that we have a Gaussian distribution and that uh, the depth of one location in some given field uh, or some environmental attribute is more related to locations that are close to that point versus points that are farther away. And so as you see here, this is a value in that field minus another value in that field based off a of location and that distance squared. And then another interesting part of this variogram equation is that we are considering uh, depths and distances, specifically distances uh, in the lateral dimension that are of certain distances away. So we have the, these bins where points that are so far away, the distance between them 
could fall into some of these bins. So there won't be a bin for exactly every length between any two points. So we have to add some tolerance and that's designated by uh, delta. And then we can basically get this function that tells us the correlation based off of distance. Now we'll use this and make a model for it. And the reason we want to make a model for it is because uh, the, the equation one is, is also quite expensive to compute every single time you get a new point. So we compute that initially, and then we can fit a simpler model to it. So here's a Gaussian model for the variogram. And we can essentially solve for these parameters. So we have the sill, the nugget, the range, and scaling factor that's related to the range. And this allows us to reduce uh, the amount of computation done by fitting a model to the empirical variogram. And so we still have this relation between distance, between any two points, and how related they are. And what we do is we use that function to form a covariance matrix. So here we have gamma, and we're giving it the distance between two points. And we do this for potentially every point in the field. Now, when we do estimating of the field with ordinary creating, we are looking for use, how can we use that covariance matrix and specifically its inverse in order to tell us what the values of the field could be that we haven't explicitly explored yet. And this can be useful for identifying areas of interest before we get to them. So what we do is we form this spatial sensitivity vector, which is this D sub I. We invert the covariance matrix, which is, again is that expensive computation. And then we actually solve for the Kriging weights along with a Lagrangian multiplier. So this adds an extra constraint, which as you'll see is actually quite useful. So we then estimate the field using the creaking weights that we, we obtained from equation five. And we can get the variance associated with, associated with a point at that field. So here we're using the Lagrangian multipliers, the creaking weights again, and the spatial sensitivity vector. And this can tell us how certain we are of a specific value in some place in the field that we have not explored yet. If the uncertainty, or in this case, the variance is high, then that value is probably going to change as we get more information. And once we actually measure it, we can see how different it is. So that covariance matrix inversion, which again is quite expensive, can be improved as I mentioned earlier. And we can use something called the Sherman Morrison formula, where we use the previous inverse, so the inverse of the covariance matrix at a previous time step with that was generated with less measurements. And we can then use uh, new measurements to augment a variation using that previous inverse. So we can essentially append extra data to our covariance matrix as part of the inverse calculation. And this can bring us down to an O of N squared computational complexity. Now, one of the drawbacks still of having O of N squared computational complexity is that it's still growing exponentially. And so we wanted to think of a way to improve the speed of doing the spatial estimation. And one of our ideas was to partition the field so that the covariance matrix being inverted is small to begin with. And rather than trying to figure out different ways to improve matrix inversion, we opted to better use the data we have. 
So what we do is we collect a set of initial measurements as before. We still form the empirical variogram. We still fit a model to the empirical variogram. And then we divide the field into subfields based off of the range of the model. And that was one of the parameters that we were able to solve for earlier. Then we can plot, apply ordinary Kriging on the subfields and thus invert a small, much smaller matrix. And then we can combine subfield estimates to form a global field estimate. And we can update the range of the model for the global field. So that, that's the field composed of all the different subfields. And then we can use the global field to estimate and form our path planner. And of course, we would repeat the above steps so that as we get more information, the uh, subdivisions might change. So they might get smaller or larger. And this allows us to reduce the complexity of the computation so much so as to have online path planning. So we can use this powerful spatial estimation to inform our path planner. And we don't have to say, you know, slow down the vehicle in order to wait for these calculations to process because they can actually take a substantial amount of time as we'll see soon. So one question is how do you define the limit for partitioning or what's the rule to partition the field based off of the knowledge of the field. So once we fit the uh, Gaussian model variogram, we have information about uh, at what point, at what distance do two points become uncorrelated. And that's the range. And specifically it's the range squared times this um, scaling factor from equation two. And so we just denote this by R naught. And so what we do is we take the potential hypotenuse of a subfield. So these are subdivided into squares or rectangles. And we divide this by the range of the global field. And we take the floor of this minus one so that it's a nice uh, index that we can use in this algorithm here. So L max is at what level, what, what is the maximum level that we can partition these fields? And so one method to do this is simply doing a binary search on the length of the X and Y dimensions, as you see here, based off of the X and Y component of some point. And then we continue to do this binary search in both dimensions based off of the level, the L max, that was dictated by equation 11. This gives us the X and Y, excuse me, the X and maximum X and the Y and maximum Y components of that subfield. So we return the bounds of the subfield. Now we constructed a simulation to show all of this working and really that broke, broke up into two simulations. So we had the location of samples of the elevation field were chosen at random. So we took all these random points and then we uh, threw it at the partitioned ordinary Kriging, ordinary Kriging and ordinary Kriging done with an iterative inverse. And then we also modeled a surface vehicle with uh, trajectory tracking and with a path planner and we would locate the places with the highest variance. And that would be how we did path planning was just locate points with the highest variance and control the vehicle to go there. And then as we get to that point and we collect more measurements along the way, we form another uh, estimate of the field and repeat. And then the idea was that the performance measures were, the performance measures are computation time and mean absolute or MAE. And we also look at um, other factors. So here we have randomized waypoint selection. So the conditions here were that we're creating an initial variogram based on an initial training set of data. And then we're estimating the field after each new measurement. So we form a field ahead of time with Gaussian 
correlation between points, we have a subset of that field used to uh, form the, the initial empirical variogram. And then we fit a model to that. And you can see here that in this case, the partitioned ordinary Kriegian, which is shown in green here, initially does not perform well. But after a certain amount of points, we see that it can outperform the other two methods. And then eventually it settles to a similar uh, mean absolute error. And interestingly enough, we have that the uh, computation time is reduced drastically compared to the other two methods. Now here are the results for the high, highest variance path planner. So here we have the, again, the mean absolute error. And on the right, we have the computation time comparison. So again, very similar in computation time to what we saw previously. However, depending on the path planner, the rate at which the mean absolute error of the global field estimate varies. So here we see something that's typical of the iterative inverse, which is that numerically uh, it's not very stable. And we see, of course, that the performance of ordinary creeping is quite well and much more stable. And then we see on the other end of this, that as a trade-off of the partitioned ordinary creeping is that it has slightly, slightly less, but still comparable error um, at the benefit of having a tremendous computational savings. So here again, the, the conditions were that the path planner chooses the next point with the highest variance. Measurements are collected along the way. So we, every time we, we move to a new location, we're still collecting measurements that are going to be incorporated into our spatial estimation. And then we recalculate the variogram model after each new measurement. And then, of course, we're estimating the field after each new measurement. So what does this look like? Well, it looks like the following. On the left, top left, we have the true field. On the right, we have ordinary creaking. You can see they're quite similar. Then on the bottom left, we have the iterative inverse ordinary creaking. Again, still quite similar, at least to uh, from this top level perspective. And here we have the partitioned ordinary creaking. And it might not be obvious what the difference is between any of these, <laughs> but that's actually a good thing. So what we found was that the partition ordinary creaking is useful for online trajectory planning. It has comparable absolute error, mean absolute error, to both the other methods. We save in computational uh, complexity immensely. And we have a benefit to partitioned ordinary creaking over the other two, which is we can update partial field estimates much faster and have the partial field estimates also be more accurate than the same area that is predicted by the other methods at any given moment in time. So I hope you enjoyed the talk. If you have any questions, please let me know and we'll answer them. Cool. Um, thank you, Pablo. Uh, that was a, a very detailed presentation. We appreciate your research. Um, and we appreciate the, everyone's contributions to this workshop. Unfortunately, we don't really have time for questions um, for Pablo. Um, but what we can do is we can leave the spreadsheet open for Q&A. And if you have any questions for any of our speakers, actually, please go ahead and, and put them in that, um, in that shared Google Doc and uh, we'll publish the answers um, as soon as we can as, we, as soon as we can get them. But we do need to cut this uh, symposium short. We have a very interesting workshop uh, panel discussion that's coming up in a few minutes and we want uh, we want to have time for people to take a quick break before that. So uh, thanks for your attendance and thanks for your participation and I look forward to seeing you uh, again in the future. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Thank you.